Hello and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. And you got Luke. I am a mathematician, philosopher, and inventor. What have you invented, Luke? Nothing, sorry. So you're I, you're on the way. I am. I basically lied about all of that. that I apologize. We are going to be talking about someone who was all of those things and more. Do you think our listeners can guess? He's one of the greatest minds of all time. I would say. You don't think so? Yeah, probably. Okay. We are talking about none other than Archimedes. Archimedes. His I friends, think I'm pronouncing that his correctly. His friends call him Archimedes. Oh. But, yes, Archimedes is the proper pronunciation. Did you know, Luke? Oh, no. He was born in 287 BC in Syracuse, Sicily. Fun fact, that is different than Syracuse, New York. But it's spelled the same. I, I don't know. It looks like it is. I would have to assume that Syracuse, Italy is named after Syracuse, New York. You can take that to the bank. To the bank. Is that what they say? Yeah. yeah. So he's most famous for being a mathematician and an inventor, like you said, from ancient Greece. And he's probably the most famous one they've ever had. Probably. He's pretty good. He, he came up with a lot of stuff. He he did. I do feel like he's a bit of a one-hit wonder. I do not agree with you that. You know, there's there's like four things he did. He didn't have a podcast. That's true. Yeah, that makes us better so far. So yeah. we'll, we'll come up with other things yeah. he did versus what we've done to see who's better. Okay. How about that? So he died in uh, 1212. 1212? That has to be wrong. You just read it wrong. It's a 212. Two, yeah, two, whoa. Wow. Yeah. 212. You're like, man, that dude made it a Holy long time. Mackerel. Yeah, yeah, he did. Uh, but also in Syracuse, Italy. So he, much 76. like. 76. Much that's like me, run. well, that's actually pretty good back then. That's Much like me, he basically lived in one city his entire life. And like you, you haven't moved a whole bunch. No. You've kind of like no. gravitated to the general Pittsburgh region your like entire half life. half of Pennsylvania, I would call it, yeah. right? Yeah. I've been, I've been 15 miles from <laughs> where so I was sad. no further than 15 miles in any direction. That's really amazing. I don't think it's sad. I think it's it shows that I'm You're a- Pittsburgh proud, right? Pittsburgh proud. Yinzer. Archimedes is especially important for his discoveries of the relation between the surface and volume of a sphere and its circumscribing cylinder. So calculating pi, correct? Oh, yeah, pi is, pi is a big part of that, yeah. He's known for his formulation of the hydrostatic principle, also known as the Archimedes principle. A.K.A. And a device for... Uh, and a device for raising water, which is still in use in developing countries, which I did not know. Um, not just developing countries, like everywhere. A lot they of still places, it. yeah. It, known as the Archimedes screw. Um, and we'll get into more detail on that later yeah, on. Of course. Right? Fun fact for you. How about this? Shoot. Ancient writings tell us that his dad was an astronomer. So he comes from a scientific background. And he actually is considered an astronomer as well because of some of the work he did with. The planets circling the sun. So, fun fact for you: I uh, hear it now uh, he has over eleven surviving works. And when they say works, these are like mm-hmm. papers mm-hmm. he wrote. They called them treatise or treaties. I think I was actually the other. avoided that word altogether. I don't know if it was treaties so I or treatise. I didn't know what it was. But one of my favorites is something. Speaking of the uh, uh, as- astronomer, is something called the sand. Reckoner, hmm, and in name. this treatise, T R E A T I S E, no idea how you pronounce it. Uh, Archimedes uh, <laughs> counted the number of grains of sand that would fit inside oh, yeah, of the universe, one. and he concluded that the number of grains of sand required to fill the universe would be eight times one hundred and thirty times 106 to the third power in like a modern notation. I don't know how many zeros that is, but so it's a lot. It was really weird because it was very weird. He basically did this because he was tired of people saying it's impossible to count how many grains of sand are on the beach and he was like, not only can you do that, but I can do this, like how much it would take to fill the whole universe. And they were saying it was impossible basically because their system of mathematics didn't have numbers that could go that high. Yeah. And so he basically made up a whole new way of counting and doing math just because, just because he was sick of people saying this. Okay, we'll give one point to the Archimedes side. So now we're even. Podcast we're even. versus inventing math. inventing math. Okay, very good. 
Uh, so can I go back to the life of Archimedes a little For bit? For sure. Man. We should probably we call Mark Archimedes. Are we going to just get yelled yeah, at Yeah, we should call Mark Archimedes. Was call he part of Bill and Ted's? I assume he must have been picked up along the way. I'm sure. Anyways, Keanu, if you're listening, uh, go ahead and give me a call on my cell because we're boys. Show. And yeah, we can talk about that. Uh, it is thought that at some point in his life, like you said, he only stayed around one city. He actually traveled to Egypt, but that he spent most of his life in Syracuse. He was this, educated in Alexandria. Yes. And he was boys with the king in Syracuse. Yeah. Heron the second. I think that's how you say it. Yeah. So he played an important role in the defense of Syracuse against the siege laid by the Romans in 213 BC. You might notice a correlation to his death date Mm -hmm. and that date uh, by constructing war machines that were so effective that they really delayed the capture of the city, which is kind of cool. When Syracuse eventually fell to the Roman general, uh, Marcus Cladius Marcellus, in the autumn of 2012, or maybe the spring of 2011, depending on your your, uh, books that you believe, Mm -hmm. Archimedes was killed in the sack of the city. So he went down with his city. Granted, he was 76. Fun fact about the city, Mm -hmm. and this is one of those, like, it's probably an old wives' tale. Supposedly, a Roman soldier came up to him heard this. and was summoning him to come see this general guy that you had mentioned. And and Archimedes was like fervently working on some mathematical calculation, and he like yeah. gave him like the one minute finger. It was like, give me a minute. And the Roman soldier got all mad and was like, ah, and yeah. he stabbed him. That's and, exactly and the noise him. he made too. I'm, ah, that's I'm, the stabbing noise. It is the stabbing noise. I'm pretty, and supposedly that's the story. Like he was literally doing. You know, math up until you know the last moment. That I could he, see my dad lived. doing that. That would be the way he goes. Uh, so much of what we know about Archimedes comes from letters that he sent to his friend, and I'm going to botch this one like normal. Eratosthenes. No, you nailed it. Who ran the library of Alexandria, which was kind of a big deal. So, a couple fun facts about that. This guy, his friend, was the successor to Alexander the Great, who is, you know, kind of well-known, and was the first person to accurately calculate the size of the Earth. So this guy was no slouch either, so that's probably why he was boys with Archimedes. Second fun fact, Archimedes was a jerk. That's not the whole fact. I kind of heard that. Like, he, uh, he th- th- there was a lot of bravado in what he bravado. did. Bravado. He liked to tease other mathematicians with his big old brain, you know? And he would give them the correct answer to a problem or whatever they were looking for the solution to. He'd give them the answer, but he wouldn't give them the steps to actually solve the problem just to see if they could figure it out. And he'd tease them along the way. What a jerk. And he also really didn't document a lot of his work that well either. A lot of the things that he came up with or that he was working on, he almost considered to be beneath him. So he didn't really document the process. And it was just like, here, here's your answer. Go away and let me get back to what I'm interested in. I feel like you and I are kind of like that. I feel like a lot of things are beneath you. And when <laughs> we try to have conversations, you just kind of like... What did someone say? I am wasn't pompous, but it was something along those lines. Oh, you're pompous. For I sure. am. Oh, you, I am. You I'm definitely done. <laughs> are. But that's not what they said. No, something no, else in addition to being pompous. Yeah, it was pretty good. But I think you're right. Just kind of like our episodes. We don't actually give you the steps along the way. We were just nope. like, so Archimedes was smart, and then we fill for 30 minutes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so how did anybody know about any of his works? So here's a kind of cool story. Are you okay with me giving a cool stories. story? The mystery of Archimedes' mathematics wasn't solved until 1906. And people were actually, even back until like 1600, didn't know how he got those answers. It took... All those years, almost 2,000 years for people to recreate the steps in math that he took to come up with this sort of stuff. That's how ahead of his time was he was. So until 1906, when Professor Johann Heiberg discovered a book in the city of Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, right? Mm-hmm. The book was a – this is really neat. The book was a Christian prayer book written in the 13th century when Constantinople was the last outpost of the Roman Empire. Uh Within the walls were stored all of these great works of ancient Greece. And this book that he found was called the Archimedes 
Palmsets? You nailed Palmists? it. Yeah, yeah. Nailed know. it. Heiberg discovered that the book's prayers had been written on top of mathematics. So I don't know if like paper was in short supply or what, but they basically wrote this prayer book over top of the mathematics. The monk who wrote the prayers tried to remove all of this useless math, so only faint traces remained. And it turned out that those traces were mathematics uh, that were the actual copies of Archimedes' work, like a giant discovery, right? So it had been copied over in the 10th century. The book contained seven of Archimedes' really important writings, including the method, which had been lo- which is like his biggest, uh, which is, had been lost for many, many centuries. So I thought that was kind of cool, right? That's exceptionally cool. Yeah. So that, that was my whole, my whole story about how they found his writings. Okay. It took them centuries and centuries to finally figure out what he did. And then centuries later, they were like, oh, yeah, we erased that and kind of wrote our prayers over uh... top of it. So that was kind of interesting. Um, a little bit more on his life, if Shoot. you're cool with that, Luke. Uh, da, da, da. I said how far ahead of his time he was, but he was buried in a tomb on which was carved a sphere with a cylinder. And that was his wish because he believed his greatest achievement was finding the formula for volume of a sphere. And if you get into the details of how he did that, it was really complicated. Many years later, uh, Cicero, the Roman governor of Sicily, uh, was looking at the tomb, looking for the tomb of Archimedes, and he found that it was super overgrown, and he cleared it off, but today, somehow, the tomb has been lost and probably is gone forever. So much of his work has also been lost, and it makes us really impressed by all of the work that he did. I'm digging it. Yeah. All right. I'm done. I'm done with We're gonna my history. We can take a break? History. Oh my goodness, I didn't even realize how long it had been. Yeah, absolutely. Time for a word from our sponsor. I'm assuming I I have nothing for this one. Ancient ancient Greece? The mob? I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) Right? Uh, No, no sponsor Mm. this week, but that's all good. Uh, But we do have a shout out. Who do we got? We got Dale F. writing in from approximately 6,690 kilometers away. So it's about four miles. Give or take four, maybe five miles in South Wales. Oh, I miscalculated. Slight miscalculation. So how about this? He particularly likes our Great Inventors episode. Nice. So how about a lucky coincidence that he lands on this episode for a shout out? Uh, He'd like us to cover, and someone else told us this before too. He'd like us to cover British engineers. He specifically said British civil engineers, such as Thomas Telford and John Rainey the Elder. Did you know? They're pretty famous. I, I never heard of them. No, me neither. But I will add them to the list, Dale. And you could write back in to unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com to let us know why they are so important to you. How about that? Yeah, make sure that you subscribe. Make sure that you review. Make sure that you like. Make sure that you listen on all of your connected devices. Fun fact, all you have to do is say, play Unprofessional Engineering to one of your smart devices, and it plays the most recent episode. How about this for a fun fact? Shoot. When you say, Alexis, play it, it does not work, because my wife does it all the time. (laughs) Because she thinks it's Alexis. (laughs) I'm glad she doesn't listen. Good. Okay, moving on. Moving on. You want to talk about some of the famous discoveries? You got something else? Yeah, so I got a bunch of discoveries that I want to talk about. Let's hear about it, Some fun, interesting stories. So... Uh, He has a lot of cool stories. He does. So the first and most famous one um, that he's probably known for, and it's named after him, is the Archimedes Screw. And the Archimedes Screw uh, is a device that allows water to be transferred from a low-lying body of water into, you know, a higher elevation. And if you think about this, you know, back in the day, you just had to do this with buckets and a whole bunch of manual labor. Uh, And this was a really great way to irrigate ditches. It was a really great way. Uh, Initially, this was invented from the way what I read uh, to pump water out of boats. So boats back in the day were always leaking, no matter how good you made them. And they would use these Archimedes screws to get water out of the bow of the boat so it wouldn't sink. You're actually saying Archimedes now by accident, aren't you? Sorry, I am. (laughs) Archimedes. Uh, So what this thing basically looks like, imagine you got a a giant tube, you know, whatever length it is, but it's a pretty big diameter, and inside of it you have a coil, uh, like a sweeping, descending coil, and as you turn that coil upwards, anything that's down below is going to get captured. Um, the, the the screw inside is so close to the walls that the water just doesn't fall out, and it sure. pulls the water up. And crazy, 
this is used. You said third world countries. They still do it in third world countries, but like irrigation in the United States, sewage plants, they still use these Archimedes screws to move sludge and liquid materials and anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see it all over the place. Um, so crazy that that still happens. Yeah. Um, so one thing I was going to throw out there, do not confuse this with the aerial screw, yes. which our good friend Leonardo DiCaprio invented. D different? Da Vinci. Oh, why don't you go check so out close. our episode on Da Vinci so if you want to check this out. Uh, also, you know, for our listeners, to get a little behind-the-scenes looks of, looks, look of how we do things here, Luke and I had, I would say, at least a few-minute debate. We'll call it five-minute debate on if we actually did this episode already. Oh, we because did. Because a lot of the stuff he did kind of sounded familiar, but maybe it was just kind of parts of other episodes. Yeah, yeah, We could not track it down, but it was really hard for us to believe that, you know, we hadn't covered Archimedes already because he just seemed like a no-brainer. So we fought about it for five minutes, not really fought, just kind of scratched our heads and realized we don't think we've done this episode. Because if it was a fight, I definitely would win. That's so. n no doubt on uh, that. So a couple other things. So you mentioned uh, the Archimedes principle, and, and this is probably the most famous thing that he, the most famous thing he's known for. And this is basically buoyancy is what oh, real quick on the archimedes screw. oh sorry did okay. you see that th there might have been a little fight about if he actually invented this thing or not or perfected it kind yeah of thing. more like maybe i he did not see that it. so it's thought because of some writings from 680 bc that the palace without rivals which is what the writing was called actually used this water screw for irrigating the gardens in Mesopotamia, so modern day Iraq. The hanging the, yeah, the hanging so this, gardens. This is what they would think the hanging gardens of Babylon were. Mm. Uh, so they think this was used and that the technology was just kind of like forgotten, or that he then maybe it went went to Egypt and saw this in use and then brought it back was and was like, the first person to like, bring it. Hey, to guess what I did? Yeah, or yeah. Basically look what I did and I perfected it. And so he just kind of got credit for okay. it. Okay. But maybe he invented it. We don't know. I wasn't there. So the Archimedes Principle, so mm -hmm. this is the law of buoyancy states that any object immersed in a fluid will experience an upward force equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. So essentially, if you think of, and, and this is what they use to calculate uh, ships and like how deep the bow is and how much a ship can mm -hmm. uh, hold, because if you think about it, like why can a cruise ship not sink, but if I throw a penny in water, it, it, it sinks. That's a good question. And it's Luke. all based off of buoyancy. There's there's enough surface area. There's enough volume. The weight of the ship doesn't exceed um, the displaced fluid weight, so it's definitely going to float. Um, they still use this all the time with running any kind of calculations sure. for something that has to float. This would have been great for one of our Engineering 101 episodes. We can probably go in a little detail more on this because it's actually a pretty complicated it subject. Is. Yeah. Uh, so a couple other things that he is credited with inventing, uh, or maybe not inventing, but at least figuring out the mathematical reasons why these things work. And this one I never knew is the fulcrum and lever. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, supposedly he had, if you give me a lever long enough, I can move the earth. Um, I don't know if you really could do that. That'd be kind of crazy. That's a big lever. Right? Um, but there's actually three types of uh, fulcrums. Uh, class one is if you think of like um, a seesaw. So that is a class one fulcrum. A class two mm. is if you think of a wheelbarrow. It is. Or burrow, however barrow. you want to say it. Barrow. Uh, you so can if say you imagine barrel there's, and be wrong. There, there's a single point and you're lifting the back and it's easier to lift because the weight is further away from you. And then the third class is more of like a uh, like a tweezer or a hammer or like a jaw where there's multiple pivot points. Too advanced um, for me. Yeah, so, uh, so the fulcrum and lever. And then very similar to the fulcrum and lever is the pulley. Uh, a pulley is a wheel or an axle on a shaft, and it's designed to support the movement and change in direction uh, of a cable and or belt. And mm -hmm. Interesting. I watched this thing about pulleys, and I never knew this. So pulleys are all about mechanical advantage. And I, I think I knew this, and I, I remember working on this stuff, but it's all about the trade-off between effort and distance. So... You can make a pulley super efficient where like yeah. you can lift like a thousand pounds by pulling down one pound. But the problem is for you to get that to raise a certain distance, it has to be 
equal to the number of pulleys. So a perfect example, if if you wanna if you wanna lift something, if if you wanna lift five hundred pounds and only lift, you know, half of that, you know, two hundred fifty pounds, I don't you need do to that you need to move it four times the distance of what the weight you're reducing it. So, uh, so there's a calculation. With, it's another 101. Yeah, it, it, it's pretty interesting. And I, I, I watched this video of this guy who was li- literally lifting like a thousand pounds like this, but it was only moving like a quarter of an inch kind yeah, of thing. So that makes sense. All right, so I have a couple of cool stories that I want to get Shoot. into. But before we do that, I think we should take a break for this week's Luke's Rant. So this is more of like a compliment to our boy uh, Archimedes. And this is the fact that, and I, I was just talking about it, the Archimedes screw. you got to realize that he's been dead 1,808 years ago. That, that's And when time. you think of a pretty decent legacy, the fact that you have, you know, the Archimedes principle named after you, and the Archimedes screw is actually something All that these is things. that still are being yeah. used. I mean, it hasn't been improved. I mean, basically, it's the exact same thing that he invented or improved, depending on mm-hmm. who you listen to, mm-hmm. um, almost two thousand years ago. So I just think that's really impressive, and, and I hope one day that you and I, via the Unprofessional Engineering Podcast, have that sort of legacy. I feel like we're well on our way, Luke. Well on our way. Well on our way. Again, if any of you want to hook us up with an honorary PhD at I'll your school, it. we are on board. We'll even do a, what's, is it a commencement speech? We'll do a is commencement. that what it's called? We can come there and broadcast live. Well, we we can come talk to your live. students, whatever you need. Just Heck let yeah. us know. Give us a PhD. Um, okay, some stories for stories. you. Stories. ready? He got so, a couple. So back to the, the lever. Lever? Lever, lever. Uh, he, like you said, give me a place to stand and I will move the earth, right? So his friend, the king, challenged Archimedes to put his claim to the test. So Archimedes arranged a cleverly designed series of cogs and pulleys in such a manner that he alone, sitting on one end of the mechanism, was actually able to draw a fully loaded vessel out of the water and place it onto the land, a task that took a hundred men to actually do otherwise so them pulling it out of the water he did it by himself with his big brain coming up with the answer so that was kind of cool uh the other story and this one's my favorite i think is about the golden crown the bathtub story the bathtub story so there's a little bit of like embellishment i think people have given but here's how it goes so his buddy the king like they must have been tight right heron the second yes heron is there an o an n Heron, maybe Heron. I typed it. Oh, I, you know what? No, you're right. You're right. Harrow? Was... Harrow. Harrow. The second. He gave, he gave a weighted crown of gold to a craftsman, or he gave him a bunch of gold to make him a yep. golden crown. And the crown he got back weighed the same amount, but the king was a little suspicious because people are bad and people do bad things. That's a good, good rule of life. Uh, he thought the craftsman had stolen some of the gold and replaced it with silver in the crown, which was less valuable, right? But he couldn't be sure because the thing weighed the same and now it's a different shape and it just slaps on his head. It's all good. So he gave it to Archimedes and told him what the problem was. Archimedes was like, yeah, I got this. You know, like, I got your mm-hmm. back. Yeah, he, he's like, how can I figure this out? It's it's pretty simple. I'll do it for you. And he knew that gold is denser than silver. So a one centimeter cube of gold would weigh more than a one centimeter cube of silver, right? And so that's what the king had handed over. The crown should still weigh the same. The problem was the crown was irregularly shaped. So its weight was known. Its volume was not. So Archimedes is believed to have measured how much the level of water in a cup was raised by sinking, say, like one kilogram of gold into it and comparing that to the amount the water was raised when he sunk one kilogram of silver. Archimedes found that the crown was a mixture of gold and silver, which was really bad news for the king. And it was even worse news for Mr. Craftsman. My guess is that guy had his head chopped off. I would guess it was something maybe worse. If you want to... If you're that kind of person, check out our episode on medieval torture devices. Ooh, I bet you they tortured the Oh, heck my out of goodness. Him. Oh. There are a lot of good ones they could have used on him. So he used the Archimedes principle to he determine did. this, that displacement and the. the yeah, interesting. yeah. And so Archimedes supposedly had yeah. this idea when he was taking a bath and he noticed that the water level was moving as he lowered and raised himself in the water, 
right? And he was so excited that he leapt out of the tub, which is not safe. Don't do that. No. Uh, and ran naked through the streets of Syracuse shouting, Eureka! Which means I've found it. Which uh, I don't think that actually was what happened. I highly doubt but it. But everybody still knows Eureka as well. I'm guessing he was in the tub, like, blowing bubbles. Whoa. Whoa. Like farting in the tub. Kind I, I, of get, thing. I get where you were going you with that. You see where I was going with for, that. Thanks for that. So Okay, those are my stories. Let's move on to anything else. So I want to talk about the Syracusa, which oh, I you think love is this one. I do. I, I I think because it this is one of those ones where they haven't proved it because they didn't find this thing. There's 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 writings about it. So the Syracusa was a ship that at the time was uh, supposedly 50 times larger than any ship ever at that time. Uh, this thing was, uh, I forget what the size was. I had it written down, but I can't find it. So 50 times bigger than, than sure. any ship. This, this thing is big. And it had all these specifications that the king gave to him because this was supposed to be a gift to um, uh, an Egyptian king or queen. Uh, I don't remember exactly who. Mm-hmm. But essentially... Um, details, Luke. Details. Well, I'm not great with details. You know that. So just think of a ship that could carry uh, up to 1,800 tons, almost 2,000 passengers, and more than 2,000 soldiers, 20 horses. It had a catapult on it. The pillars inside of the ship that were supporting the deck above it were supposedly carvings of Atlas holding up the globe. That's cool. Um, I mean, this thing was like abs- It was like a floating city. And this thing was created around 240 B.C. Uh, in Corinth, and it only sailed one time, supposedly. Seems to, like a waste. It kind of does. It's a, lot, it's a lot of work for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, it, essentially, th- they call this the Titanic of you know, the Greek Empire, because, except it didn't sink. Uh, <laughs> but... The the thing minor, about this is detail. they never found it. Like they, th- th- there's writings about it, but they never actually. Now, granted, this is you know two thousand years ago, sure. So who knows, you know where things this thing happen. is and things could have happened. But this was just so amazing that you could build something. And whenever he, this is also where he supposedly had this eureka moment in the tub, was. He was thinking, how am I going to make a ship that's 50 times larger and have this thing not sink? Because, you know, back in the day, if it's big and heavy, it sinks. That was just kind of the theory. And this is 50 times bigger. So I heard that the Eureka tub story was actually about the Syracusa and not the crown. Ooh, so I think the there's plot a, thickens. Yeah, so I, I think basically there's a little bit of historical kind of you know, mishmashing happening there. Massaging. Happen, so. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So another thing we mentioned that he invented is pie and not blueberry or apple Ooh. or what's your favorite pie? My favorite pie is cherry. Cherry? Well, oh. cherry's a good one, but you have to get the right kind of cherry to sugar ratio. Yeah. You got to get there. it in Michigan too, because Michigan's oh, really well is known that for right? the cherries. Oh, okay. Very good. I th- Man, how about a lemon meringue Ooh. or a yeah. Banana cream. Banana oh, cream. Yeah. Okay. I love pie. Okay. So he made the number, you know, that little symbol, kind of like the artist formerly known as Prince, mm-hmm. but different. Um, basically, pie is the number you get when you divide the circumference of any circle by its diameter. There's this giant stinking story that goes along with this. Okay? okay. But basically, he's staring at this circle and he's like, I can't calculate that. But what he can calculate is the a triangle and another triangle. So he drew a triangle touching the outside of the circle on Mm -hmm. all three lines of the triangle, and then an inside one where each point touched the circle, and he calculated those values. And he's like, well, that's a really crappy estimate. And so then he drew like a hexagon and like more and more and more and more and more sides of Mm -hmm. it, which he was able to do the math of to calculate because they already had this stuff figured out until he got it so that the whatever it is, Parallelogram? No, that's not right. No. Whatever that shape is, like, like a octagon, but with more sides. Polygon. Polygon. Yes, polygon. Mul- multiple. Yeah, poly. Yeah, many. polygon. Yeah. So I think he got it to ninety-two, 
sides. What? And it got to the point where you like, without magnifying, you couldn't see that it wasn't a circle. I gotcha. And that's how he did the calculations. And he got the numbers so ridiculously close that, oh, it was 96-sided polygon. I should have read my notes. Um, so using this 96-sided polygon, Archimedes found that pi was greater than the fraction of... 25,344 divided by 8,069 and less than 29,376 divided by 9,347. So he did us a favor. He did us a solid because he's a good guy, even though he's a jerk. And he rounded that number off to saying it was bigger than 3 and 10 71sts and 3 and 1 7th, which was pretty small. So we figured out the limits to be somewhere around 3.14186815. And we actually rounded that number up. And until the digital age, when we could use calculators, we never went past, we never went past it. Like we used his number forever up and, until like technology. And do you really need it to be more than two no. or three decimal places for most cases? Right. So super big brain coming up with crazy math. I have, I have one more. I, I, I think it's a legendary fact. So you mentioned fact. earlier on about uh, the siege of yeah. Syracuse, and he made all these crazy war machines, catapults, things that I would shoot logs one. out. And this one I never heard of, and then I saw a picture, and then I was like, huh, and I looked it up. So supposedly he had an elaborate system of mirrors where he was able to capture the sun's rays and burn the boats that were attacking Syracuse. Yeah. Supposedly this is like that f- Don't kind of fact this, fiction. Luke. I love it. So I've I was told that maybe it was mirrors, I was told it was maybe really shiny bronze shields. Okay. And that the boats were painted in tar paint, which could have helped them ignite but better. Do you know how hard it is to do other magnifying glass and get it like well, right on? And these ships are like hundreds of yards away. Other I mean, people have questioned this before, Luke, such as Mythbusters, as well as students oh, at MIT. And they checked it out? MIT made a boat and covered it in this tar paint mm-hmm. and were able to get it to ignite kind of in okay. spots okay. after a long time. And on a perfectly sunny All day. All the ship has to do is move. Yeah. Okay. And Mythbusters basically got like the wood to smoke and maybe a little fire, but not enough to like spread and burn the thing out. So they considered it busted okay. and a myth. Okay. But in theory, if the boat wasn't moving, because you know they weren't easy to move, maybe, especially back maybe, then. Maybe. If it was a super sunny day and he had a whole bunch of stuff going on, maybe he lit a boat on fire. <laughs> maybe. All he needs is a dragon. Yeah. That's all he needed. That is, I mean, if Game of Thrones taught us anything, all you need is a dragon. Of course. Uh, one thing. Do you have anything else you That's want it, to I talk got. about? The last thing I wanted to mention is his favorite and most important finding, according to him, was calculating the volume of spheres. I literally, unlike everything else, I have two lines written on it. Uh, and that's all I had. It's his greatest personal thing, and I don't want to go into the math. So he was a big fan of that as well. So hopefully you guys all found this very interesting, like I did, because I love the histories. Yeah. If you have any other great ideas, if you want some stickers, whatever you want to do, give us a shout-out and email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. Until next time. See ya.